Good morning. He is risen. Amen. Chris and I, Chris Moore and I were laughing a little bit this week at uh, our tendency um, to only sing the song, Christ the Lord is Risen Today on Easter Sunday. So it's like the one time a year that we, we sing that song. Uh, every church I've been in, actually, it's like that one Sunday we get to sing that song. But we know that we can legitimately sing that song on any Sunday during the year because Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, never to die again. And with this being true, we can sing that song actually every day, not just every Sunday, but every day. It's true that every day Jesus is alive. Which means that if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you can remind yourself every day of your glorious future with Him in heaven. Eternal life is inextricably linked to Jesus' resurrection. Then read 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 earlier. I'll read it again. This is where we get the name of our church. Peter writes, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.'" According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, it's because of us being born again to this living hope through the resurrection of Christ that we can look forward And think of heaven where our inheritance lies. And that inheritance can't be taken away from us. It cannot be corrupted. Time does nothing to take it away or to diminish it whatsoever. So every day you can sing the song, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hope is alive because Jesus is alive. That's kind of a summary we use of 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Every day it is a fact that you have eternal life because of Jesus' resurrection, if you have come to him in faith. So the resurrection changes your eternity, doesn't it? It changes your forever. But it also changes life here and now. Not just your eternity, but your life today and tomorrow and the rest of the week. Through the mundane moments of life, the common routines The resurrection transforms those things too. Let me take you through a week where you might have different different challenges each day of the week and how the resurrection applies. It's Monday, 4 p.m., and you've yelled at your kids again, and you're beating yourself up because you feel the weight of guilt. It's Tuesday, 9.30 p.m., and The temptation to pull out your phone is there. So you can view lurid images, and the temptation seems too strong to deny. It's Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the doctor gives you another difficult report, and you're struggling with doubt. You're beginning to doubt God's goodness. It's Thursday, 1.30 in the afternoon, and, and you have just gotten off the phone with that loved one who has berated you for your faith. On top of that, you've just lost your job and the bills that are unpaid are beginning to pile up. It's Friday, seven at night, and you're frustrated because you have been praying for a person and texting messages of encouragement over and over again for weeks, but this person seems to be indifferent to your ministry. For each of these challenges, the resurrection matters. The resurrection of Jesus Christ impacts everyday life, not just our eternity, but our everyday common routines. We often talk about the cross significantly more than we talk about the empty tomb. But even less, we talk about the resurrection when it comes to how the resurrection changes these ordinary affairs. And I want to change that today. And so we're going to look at five ways that the resurrection impacts everyday life. And maybe you're here today and you haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ 
and this is new to you. Or maybe you know what the gospel is, but you have never bowed the knee to Christ in faith to receive his salvation. As you hear these promises for everyday life, not just eternity, but for everyday life, because of the resurrection of Christ, this is an invitation to you, a call, an urgent call for you to come to Christ and be saved. And so let's pray before we jump into our first point. Gracious Father, we thank you for these truths that we're about to encounter in your word. Pray that you would please deliver these truths with power by, by the Spirit to our hearts so that, so that those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ are drawn to you through Christ. And for those who do know Christ, who have been saved by you, that they would be encouraged, comforted, that their faith in you would be bolstered here today and that you would be worshiped as we leave here seeking by the Spirit's power to obey you afresh. We pray that you would do this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first way that the resurrection impacts everyday life is that God accepts you. If you have come to Christ in faith, then God accepts you. We find this in Romans chapter 4. Turn with me there. Romans chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. I'm going to have you flipping around quite a bit today. It's more of a, a topical sermon on the resurrection. This is what Paul writes, Romans chapter 4, verse 23. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, speaking of Abraham, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and, listen, raised for our justification. Isn't that interesting? Raised for our justification. What is justification? Paul is using Abraham in this context as an example here of one who is counted as righteous before God through his faith in God. And we, we too, are counted righteous in the same way. Not through obeying God's law, but by believing in God. But specifically here, now we must believe in Jesus' death and his resurrection for this to be true. And outside of this faith, in Christ, his death and resurrection, we're all unrighteous. And this is an enormous problem because God demands righteousness, which we can't supply. You can't supply it, I can't supply it. But listen, Jesus died to pay for our unrighteousness, and he was raised to prove that he accomplished his mission. The cross and the empty tomb cannot be separated. You know this. The cross and the empty tomb cannot be separated. We usually associate justification with the cross of Christ, his death. Even in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, in the next chapter, it reads, justified by his blood. But you cannot have his substitutionary death without his victorious resurrection. I like what... Stephen Matthewson says, he says, Jesus' resurrection gives us confidence that God's plan to give us right standing through faith in Christ has worked. You see what he's saying? God has a plan to make you righteous, to, to have a right standing before him. And because Christ rose from the grave, you can be sure that his plan was accomplished. It worked. If our Savior remained dead, he would be no savior at all. He would have no claim on us. We would have no hope that he had paid for our sin. We would have no hope that we were forgiven. Listen, you can, you can call anyone whose bones are still buried in this earth a savior, but it doesn't make them a savior. Listen, if that... If you call somebody a savior who's still buried here on this earth, there's no vindication, there's no victory, there's no justification. But for Jesus Christ, he's alive. He's risen. He's at the right hand of the Father. Jesus died and was raised, and therefore we are counted as righteous before God. We've been declared as righteous because Christ's righteousness has been given to us in a judicial sense so that we are accepted by God 
on the merit of his son. Now, this is wonderfully practical. Let's go back to that example. Monday afternoon. You've yelled at your kids again, and you're responding to feelings of guilt by rehearsing to yourself what a bad parent you are. Comparing yourself to to all the other godly parents that you know, or all the people who seem like they're better parents than you on Instagram or Facebook, and, and you're making yourself feel miserable until you feel like a sufficient amount of time has passed and you've beat yourself up enough. How does the resurrection of Christ impact that time on Monday? Well, you need to take the resurrection and you need to interrupt this spiritual self-punishment with the thought of the empty tomb because it is the empty tomb that declares to us that God's plan worked. You stand before God righteous in Christ. Your sins are washed away. Don't act like he's still in the tomb. He's not. I love, I love what Dave read earlier from Luke chapter 24. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here for his risen. Don't act like he's still in the tomb. And with this in mind, you can leave the atoning to Jesus. We try to self-atone for our sins and our guilt, don't we? Now, self-atonement's not a thing. We can't actually achieve any atonement left to ourselves. That belongs to Christ and Christ alone. But we functionally act like we can. When you believe this truth, you tell yourself that because of the resurrection, it tell, that empty tomb is declaring that God's plan worked and you are righteous. You are accepted by God through Jesus Christ. And you know what? You don't have to keep trying to self-atone. You can rest in the acceptance you've been given through Jesus Christ. And you know what? Then you're free to confess your sin, free to repent, and take the next step by the Spirit's power in faith. The resurrection matters. It matters for everyday life. It impacts everyday life also because point number two, you are new. You are new. Look with me at Romans chapter 6. A couple of chapters to the right. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 4, tells us about our newness in Christ. Verse 4 says, we were buried therefore with him, that's Jesus, by baptism and to death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you those references to the resurrection here? This text tells us why we do baptism the way we do baptism. Listen, no one is saved through baptism, but when someone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, they are made new. They are united to Christ through faith in him, in his death and resurrection. And so when you see someone baptized here at this church, they go under the water, which symbolizes that they have died. The old self has died. And then they come up out of the water to symbolize that they now are new in Christ through being united to him by God's grace through faith. They walk in newness of life. And so that's what, that's what baptism symbolizes. So when we think about the unity of Christ, we, we need to then think about the life that he has now given us to live. I love what Ben said on Friday night, if you were here for the Good Friday service. He said that when Christ died, and we died with him, because we're united to him through our faith. When we died, the, the old you, the old self, stayed in the tomb. You came to life, right? You were resurrected with Christ to walk in newness of life, but the old you did not come up. It stayed in the tomb. 
Praise the Lord for this. Without the resurrection, we would not have newness of life, which means that there would be no freedom from the enslaving power of sin. We would still be under sin's tyrannical rule. But as it is, we can consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We have a new relationship to God and a new relationship to sin in Christ. Both. We can actively glorify God now as new creatures with new hearts. And you know what? We don't have to sin. So when it comes to obedience for us, because we're new in Christ, we can't say, I can't. We can't say, I can't do that, Lord, because we are new. We can. We have the spirit. We have new hearts. Absolutely, we can obey. We don't have to sin. Sin's enslavement has been broken. But yet, functionally, it's like we walk back into that jail cell of sin. And we turn our backs to the door and we look at the bars on the other side. All the while, that door is wide open. And we put ourselves in there as if the door is not open, as if it's locked and there's no way out. Why do we do that? When we have been freed, we are new. We need to remember that we are new. So let's take that back to Tuesday. Tuesday night, 9.30. You're strongly tempted to pull out your phone and navigate to some lustful images. It feels to you as if this act is inevitable, as, as if you can't stop it. But you need to remember your union with Christ. You need to remember that you are new. Remember that you're united to him in his death and his resurrection. The jail cell door is wide open. You can walk out. You are not who you once were. And sin's dominion has been severed, broken, destroyed. Because of your union with Christ, you can choose the way of escape that God promises you. Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13? God is faithful. He will not tempt you beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it, so that you'll be able to walk through that temptation, not giving in to it. God provides a way of escape. And then there's a command right after that promise. It says, flee idolatry. You can flee idolatry. I can too. It might seem to you like the temptation is so very strong, like you have to get into it, give into it, but you don't have to. You remember the truth. You preach the gospel to yourself. Your union with Christ means that you can say no, and you can say yes to God. So when we resign ourselves to temptation, we need to remember that we're acting like Jesus is still in the tomb. Because if we functionally believe that Jesus is raised, then we will also believe that we are alive with him and therefore able to reject sin and to choose to please God instead. You see how the resurrection impacts your everyday. It also impacts your everyday life because this reality is true. Jesus prays for you. Point number three. Jesus prays for you. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, 33 and 34. What does it matter that Jesus prays for us? And and what does it have to do with the resurrection? I think you'll see here. Romans 8, 33 and 34, Paul asks a question and then answers it. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was necessary so that Jesus could then ascend to his place of authority at the right hand of God the Father. And it is there at that place of authority at God's right hand that Jesus is interceding for us. And that is that Jesus is praying for each of us. Why would he do that? Why would he need to pray for us? Like what Peter O'Brien says here, he says, Jesus' prayers for us cover anything and everything that would prevent us from receiving the final salvation he has won for us at the cross. So he prays, and it's an assurance for us that we will make it to our final 
resting place. We will experience fullness of salvation. We see an example of Christ praying for Peter in Luke chapter 22. Look with me there for a moment. Luke chapter 22, 31 and 32. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Mm. For us, we can say the same thing about this church, the believers here. Every believer, in fact, like Peter, all who trust in Jesus and belong to him will not see their faith finally fail. It may be that your faith is weak. It may be small, but it's not going to fail completely. No, because Jesus is praying for you. And that is only because he rose and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Look with me at Hebrews 7, 23 through 25. It gives a little bit more nuance here when it comes to this important doctrine of Christ's intercession. Hebrews chapter 7. 23 through 25. Author writes, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Always. Now listen, sadly, we neglect to pray for each other. Or we forget to pray for each other because of poor planning. We also struggle to pray for those that we haven't seen in a while. Or we only pray for those who seem to have serious trials at the moment. But none of this is true with Jesus. None. He will never forget to pray for you. He will never let other things crowd out his prayers for you. Do you see what it says here in the text? He always lives to make intercession for them. He is risen never to die again. Therefore, his prayers for you continue. He always lives to pray for you, Christian. Now let's take that truth. Let's go back to Wednesday at 10 a.m. You're at the doctor's office and there's more bad news. You begin to doubt God's goodness, asking questions like, why? Why would God choose this for me? This doesn't feel like love. My friend's trial seems so much easier than mine. Why can't God give me a break? All I want is to serve him. Why is he making it so hard? In your doubts, Jesus hasn't stopped praying for you. Remember that. Don't let your doubts lead you to despair. These doubts will not keep you from the glory of heaven that awaits you. Why? Because he always lives to intercede for you. His prayers will work to bring you to your final destination in the new Jerusalem. Full salvation, the experience of it in his presence. So... You see again that the resurrection impacts not just your eternity, but your every day. Also because this is true, suffering is hopeful, point number four. Suffering is hopeful. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. Suffering is hopeful. And this is tied to the truth of the resurrection. Look with me there. Verse 8, 2 Corinthians 1. Paul writing says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We tend to think of Paul as being 
a bold stalwart of the Christian faith. And that he is. But this is not something that was true of him innately. He knows that. The letter of 2 Corinthians actually has Paul expressing much of his personal weakness as we see here. And it's not just here in 2 Corinthians either. Now, it it may seem a bit strange to us that Paul is being so open with his weaknesses here, right? When it comes to our weaknesses, we'd rather not broadcast them, right? We'd rather kind of keep our cards close to our chest. We'd rather people not know how weak we truly are. And especially if we're in some position of authority like Paul, we think that weakness is something we, we better keep quiet. We want to keep up the illusion that people think we're stronger than we really are. But Paul is emphatic here. He tells the church in Corinth that they experienced affliction. And the result was that they were utterly burdened beyond any sense of their own strength. So that they thought that this was actually the end for them. As far as they were concerned, they actually had received the sentence of death. But Paul understands that this was not without purpose. He believes and a sovereign, good God who has intention in everything for his people. The sovereign God he serves brought this affliction into their lives so that they would not trust in themselves, having lost all semblance of their own strength, and instead trust in God. And in God, you and I both know there's no weakness. There is no weakness. Whenever you go for a job interview, you might be asked about your strengths and your weaknesses right? And you know, if you actually don't give them any weaknesses, if they say, what would you consider your weaknesses to be? And you say nothing, you're in trouble because they know that everybody has weaknesses. And so it's kind of like a test, like you better give me something, man, you know, because no human being doesn't have weakness. But that's not true of God. He has no weakness. And in fact, to drive home this point, that God can be trusted instead of ourselves, right? Paul adds that God is the one who raises the dead. When you have some some time this week, I want you to to go read 1 Corinthians 15. Um, It tells us that Paul is building a case uh, for our future resurrection because our future resurrection is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so there's this argument he's he's, uh, developing in that chapter. But listen, Because God raised Jesus and we're united to him, we will worship God on the new earth with resurrection bodies like his. This is important to remember and to understand. God raises the dead. He he raised Christ and he will raise us in the future because our resurrection is linked to his. So in your trials, when you feel like you've got nothing left, You can remember the power of God who raised Jesus and who will raise you in the future, and you can trust him as infinitely capable to help you as you suffer. It's good news. When you suffer, don't try to to prop up some veneer of your own strength in yourself. It's an illusion, isn't it? Realize that one of the reasons that God brings affliction into our lives is so that we would trust him more, and that trust is in no way a trust that will be disappointed since he is the God who raises the dead. Whatever you're walking through, you can tell yourself that. God can be trusted because God is the one who raises the dead. Let's go back to Thursday, 1.30, with this truth. You just got off the phone with that family member who berated you for your faith and On top of that, you you sit at your kitchen table having lost your job and you're looking at all of these bills that need to be paid and you don't have the income for it. Life is like that sometimes. We feel like trials are heaped upon us. We feel like it's not letting up. We're at the end of our rope. We're at the bottom of the barrel. All we see is weakness in those moments. You know how easy it is for us in those moments to despair and to let hopelessness take over. My brothers and sisters, don't forget. Don't forget the God who raises the dead. 
the God who raised Jesus and therefore will raise you, he is your refuge. He is your strength. He is your deliverer. Trust in him and take the next step of faithfulness. And then when you've taken that step and you feel that temptation toward hopelessness and despair once again, then you know what? You remind yourself of God who raised the dead again and you take the next step and keep doing it. Walking by faith in the power of the Spirit in what is faithful in the next decision. The resurrection impacts eternity and everyday life. And we see this in point number five. Your service matters. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. You can flip back a page in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Verse 58, at the very end of this chapter, begins with, Therefore, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And on our last point I just mentioned, 1 Corinthians 15, it's this long chapter full of profound truth wherein Paul argues for the necessity of belief in the resurrection of the dead. Because as he says, if the dead are not raised, then that means Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then you're still in your sins. There's more to Paul's argument, but for our verse here at the end of the chapter, we need to know that it's the resurrection, which is the topic of the entire chapter. The resurrection gives this verse, verse 58, its power and its motivation. Therefore, it says, because of the reality of the resurrection, Christ and ours, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that Jesus victoriously defeated death in his death and his resurrection, we can be sure of our future resurrection. And in response to this glorious reality, we ought to labor for the Lord. We ought to labor in his power. And as we do this, we can be sure of a promise that is made here. A promise. We can be sure that this labor is not wasted. You see that? Knowing that in the Lord you're Labor is not in vain. God uses your labor in the Lord. He doesn't waste it. Actually, He makes it profitable in His plan. The resurrection makes your service for the Lord matter. So listen, no one has to see your service for this to be true. No one has to applaud your service for this to be true. It doesn't have to be a big deal in the world's eyes. It can be seemingly small. It can be seemingly insignificant. But the resurrection makes it matter. God will not waste it. Believe that. That truth we can take back as well. Let's go back to Friday, 7 p.m. You've been praying for someone earnestly and regularly and texting them encouragement but it seems like they don't really care. You've been kind of focused. You, you want to bear a burden with them? You want, you want them to know that you, you really are a person who cares about them? And, and you're getting maybe a response every once in a while that seems obligatory. It, it seems half-hearted. You want to give up. You, you think to yourself, uh, if, if it's not going to really mean anything to them, why should I even do it? Why should I pray for them? Why should I text them encouragement? You can take 1 Corinthians 15, 58, this resurrection truth, and you can tell yourself because of the resurrection, it means something in God's plan, even if it doesn't mean something to that person. It means something in God's plan. It means something in God's kingdom. You may never see that this is true. You may never see the fruit of your labor. But we've got to remember, we, we are Christians. We are those who live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for us. We look to what is unseen. We believe what the Word says. You look to 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and though you don't see any fruit from your labors, you can, you can understand, you can believe God's using it. As He unfolds His plan, as He's building His church, as He's glorifying His name, it is not wasted. It matters. You see that the resurrection impacts not just your eternity, 
but your everyday life. And again, I say, perhaps you're hearing these things and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I do. I want to sincerely urge you to come to Jesus Christ because these promises are for those who belong to Him through faith in Him. His life, His death, His resurrection because no one can come to God left to themselves. We can't be good enough. We can't work enough. We, even our, our good deeds, our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, the Bible says. The only one who can give you salvation, the only one who can bring you to God and reconcile you to Him so that He's no longer your judge, but He is your Father. The only one is Jesus Christ because He took care of the sin problem and He rose again telling us God's plan worked. Will you believe? Will you believe in Christ today? Will you come and talk to me or Ben or one of the other elders or one of the other believers here about the gospel of Jesus Christ? We'll give you resources. We'd love to go get coffee with you and talk to you more about the greatest news that exists of Jesus Christ crucified and risen for sinners who trust in Him. If you're a believer here today, then I hope that the Word of God has given you more ammunition for the challenges you face, more ammunition for unbelief, more ammunition against your sin, against your despair. You can take these truths, these resurrection realities, and you can have them at the ready whenever you're tempted. Because this week, these examples, some of these examples you will experience this very week or ones that are like it. And so you can take these truths, you can take these scriptures, put them in your phone, write them down on a three by five card, tape them to your mirror, have them at the ready. They're true. And you know, the reason why we know it is because Jesus Christ died and he rose again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just something that impacts our eternity, but our everyday life as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, Thank you for these truths. Pray that we would believe them, Lord. Pray for the unbelievers here that you would save them and draw them to yourself, Lord God, that you would conquer their unbelief, conquer their hardness of heart. Lord, make them new. Unite them to Jesus Christ through faith that you supply. And for the Christians here, Lord God, I pray that they would not soon forget these things because we will be tempted this week. And if we have the resurrection near then we don't have to despair. We don't have to sin. We don't have to respond in anger. We don't have to respond in hopelessness because we have seen that Jesus Christ is not among the dead, but He is living. And therefore, our hope can be alive. It is alive because Jesus